It's round three of the World Cup and so far I've covered a lot of interesting games featuring brilliant peace sacrifices, mating attacks, but there's also a lot of drama and missed opportunities. We are going to have a look at the mini-match in round three between Fabiano Caruana and Mustafa Yilmaz and what happened in their match is simply incredible. So let's have a look at their first game or not actually the entire game. I would like to show you the key moment of that uh, game. Here it is, you can see the board, uh, white is uh, Fabiano Caruana and he has been pressing quite a lot. He has uh, a very nice advantage thanks to the pawns on uh, A5 and uh, B6 and he hopes that he is able to create a, a passed pawn. Here, Fabiano, however, uh, missed a golden opportunity and I hope you are able to find it. Just pause the video for a second Think about what you would play here and then I make use of the opportunity to thank you all for subscribing to the channel. We are getting very close to the thousand subscribers and of course that's not our goal. We will just get more and more and more. And now in the meantime I hope you have seen the best continuation for, uh, for White here. It's not the move Fabiano played. Fabiano played here the move A6. And uh, looks very tempting to play this move after b takes a6. There's rook takes c6. But I will show you what happened later. Instead of playing a6, the key move is a brilliant rook sacrifice. Rook takes c6, grabbing the pawn. And this b pawn cannot really capture, capture the rook. Because after b takes c6, the a pawn moves up. And uh, two connected past pawns, they are unstoppable. Because if you do take the b pawn here as black... It's uh, a7 and the a pawn will queen on the next move. The bishop on f1 prevents the rook from getting behind. And so therefore the pawn is unstoppable. Of course, the pawn on b6 doesn't have to be captured. But the problem is that this bishop is not helping in defense. Uh, if you bring the king, for instance, there will follow a7. And after moving the rook away, the other pawn will come up to the seventh rank as well, attacking the rook. And now after rook takes pawn, it's b8 queen, it's game over. For somebody of uh, Fabiano's uh, strength, it's incredible he missed this uh, opportunity. Instead, I will quickly show you what happened in the game. He played the move a6, very tempting. After b takes a6, rook takes c6. It looks as if white is winning here as well. There will follow bishop takes a6, b7, rook c8. Looks like it's game over, but definitely he overlooked this amazing resource here by black as the bishop can come back to g6. Now, if you do take the pawn, which was played, there is bishop e8 attacking the rook. The rook needs to keep the pawn on b6 defended. Otherwise, black is just going to take it. If you play rook d6, now the king comes into e7 hitting the rook. After rook takes d5, rook takes b6, white is a pawn up, but this d pawn is not dangerous at all. And 15 more moves and the game was agreed to a draw. No winning chances here for, for white at all. But here you see, this is a heartbreaking moment for Fabiano. He had victory in his hands and instead of winning the game, he needs to play the second game with the black pieces. Let's see what happened there. So... Yilmaz playing with the white pieces, he is a very strong grandmaster from Turkey, 26-39. Uh, of course, Fabiano is the main favorite in this, uh, this mini-match, but we see that anything can happen in uh, just such a short um, uh, match just with uh, only two games and possible tie-breaks. Yilmaz plays d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, b6. This is the Queen's Indian. White also intends to fianchetto the bishop. And here, black goes bishop a6 to attack the pawn. Many options for white here. Uh, Yilmaz goes for b3. Very solid move. Bishop b4 check. And after bishop d2, bishops can be swapped here with bishop takes d2. But bishop e7 played. It's a very um, well-known theoretical line. If you see this for the first time, you think, why? Did black not just play bishop e7 straight away? Well, in a lot of situations, the bishop is better placed on this diagonal. Now the bishop can still go to the diagonal by playing bishop c3, but then the knight cannot go to that ideal square. So white's for choice. White played here knight c3, intending even to play the move e4. So black goes for the move d5, pressurizing the pawn on c4 with both the pawn and bishop. C takes d5. So we get a fixed pawn formation in the center. Bishop g2, castling king side, castling king side, knight bd7. 
very standard way of uh, playing and white goes for the move knight e5. Ambitious move, putting pressure on this pawn on uh, d5, even knight c6 could be an idea to attack both the queen and bishop. And therefore, bishop goes back to b7. Looks slightly passive, but black's structure is very solid and also offers chances to uh, to play for uh, for more later on, as we will get to see. White goes rook c1, placing the rook on the half-open file. Black does it with its own rook, placing the rook on e8. Who knows? It can be useful later on on um, on um, attacking the pawn on uh, on e2. And here, interesting subtle uh, moment. White. Played here the move rook to c2. This looks strange, but it's a useful waiting move over protecting the pawn on e2 later on. But also, you may have ideas to double your rooks. And there's another interesting idea. Black goes h6. Now, bishop went to, uh, to f4. So you see potential pressure here. Black reroutes at knight from uh, d7 to f8. It's on its way to, uh, to e6. So the bishop isn't that very that stable here at all. And instead, the bishop uh, decides to come back to, uh, to c1. This has all been seen in, uh, in earlier games. It's, uh, it's a maneuvering game. The game starts slowly, but it's everything but boring, guys. Let's just see what happens. The knight comes to e6. Bishop to b2. So hopefully, at some point, this bishop uh, will come alive on this diagonal. Black goes c6 over protecting the pawn. And white goes e3. Bishop to d6. Well, the game, as I said, it starts really quietly, but soon we will uh, get to see some interaction. It's uh, We are basically waiting for black to go c6, c5, or white at some point would like to play e4, but with its last move, knight e2, white has given up on that idea. And after rook c8, over protecting the pawn, of course, the knight comes to uh, to f4. So there's his option to, to take on, um, on f4. Uh, but there's no need to, to do so. You can also start with uh, with rook to uh, to c7. And, uh, well, black is uh, preparing to place its queen on c8 to give some more uh, strength to that uh, idea to uh, push the, the c-pawn. And here, why deviates from, uh, from earlier games? One idea is rook e1. It's a useful waiting move. After knight takes f4, E takes f4 is the common way of playing, so that you're trying to maintain that knight on e5 and the rook is also doing well supporting it. Obviously, you don't have to take, but rook e1 is uh, a logical way of uh, playing. Instead, Yumas played here the move queen a1. And although I understand the move that uh, you're looking for some way to open the diagonal at some point, but it's not really clear if that's going to happen. Maybe the rook wants to come to c1 as well. But on the other hand, the queen is far away from the action. Black decided here to take on f4 and still e takes f4 would have been a very reasonable option but Yilmaz had a different plan. He decided to take with the g-pawn so to capture towards the center strengthening the knight and it opens up the g-file but is it a really weakening of white's king's position? Well we will get to see that. Black also feels like it needs to, uh, to activate its uh, pieces and played here queen c8. That's a very good move and here Okay, uh, Yilmaz admitted that the queen was not doing too well on uh, on a1, decided to come back to d1, which makes sense. You would like to have your queen closer to your uh, to your king with such a pawn weakness. But here black goes c5. Very, uh, very interesting move. Now we have finally some tension between white uh, and the black pawn. And of course, white got to think how to re react or not to react at all. But if you ignore it, then black has even ideas to further expand with the move c4, maybe play b5, b4, maybe create a passed pawn like that. So Yilmaz decides, okay, let's take on c5. Very interesting position. And here black recaptures with the b pawn. So we have a classical position with hanging pawns. Are these pawns really good or there are potential targets? Well, that uh, remains to be seen. General strategy for white could be trying to offer the exchange of pieces because the more pieces come off the board, the harder it will, for, will be for black to keep these pawns uh, defended. Typical move here could be rook d2, maintaining pressure. And if black would activate its queen, which was one of the ideas of queen c8, 
there's Queen C2, and uh, you can follow that uh, plan of uh, offering the exchange of, of pieces. However, Yulmaz had a totally different idea in mind. Played here the move, King to H1. Placing the King in the corner. The King is still safe, although it's still potentially vulnerable on, uh, on this diagonal, but White is also looking for plans to take over the G-file himself. Here, I think Fabiano was really struggling to come up with a good plan, and he decided to drop back with its bishop from d6 to f8. But I would like to point out that a very active move like queen f5 does make sense. To keep in touch with his rook, if white continues with its original idea to play rook g1, now the thematical break here is d5, d4, opening up the position, trying to remove that bishop. If you, um, if you take on b7 and then you take on d4, for instance, you take twice, then eventually the pawn on f4 will be hanging. So that is one idea of playing the move d4, open up the position and try to prove that white's structure is quite vulnerable. Another idea after e takes d4 could be to play knight e4, just jumping in with your knight to e4, keeping bishops on the board. Now queen takes f4 is an idea, followed by knight takes f2. Um, and if you protect the pawn, for instance, with queen c1, C takes d4. This is a fantastic shot. This is not a forcing line at all, but I would like to show you what Black's chances are, um, are about in such position. If you take the rook on c7, it's made on f2. You cannot allow that, such a smothered mate. Uh, therefore, the rook is a very important defender. But if you take on uh, d4 here yourself, it's rook takes c2, queen takes c2, and now here we see the usefulness having the queen here. It's knight g3 with a discovered check. If you take with a pawn, screen takes c2, black wins the game. So I think black should have tried to play more actively here with the move queen f5 and trying to get in this move d4. Now we get to see the difference with the game's continuation as black played bishop f8. It's a solid move, but it makes life much easier for white. White goes rook g1, black goes rook to d8. White played here the move rook d2. And still, maybe something like d4 could have been uh, considered. And therefore, instead of playing uh, the move rook d2, something like f3 could have been very interesting. So that after a move like d4, you can always try to close the position with e4. That's what we get to see in the game. After rook d2, d4 was not played here. Queen to e6. And now white played the move f3. Excellent move. Again, Fabiano didn't know what to do. Played rook d8. But what are these rooks? doing there. I understand the rook is not feeling entirely happy being unprotected on uh, on that square. But here white goes bishop to f1. The bishop has nothing else to do on this long diagonal any longer and uh, vacates the g2 square for the rook. Black played here to move d4, opening up the diagonal for the bishop, trying to lock up this bishop on b2. But white has the key move e4. Very nice move and uh, these pawns have been uh, brought to halt. Black goes knight h5. The pawn on f4 is a target. Knight takes f4 is on the agenda, but it's white's turn first. Bishop c4. The bishop comes alive, hits the queen. If the queen goes away, it's also standing in the diagonal of the, um, of the black king. And the question is, where is the queen going? If you go uh, queen h3, maybe something like rook g4 protecting the... Um, the uh, pawn on uh, f4 and also bishop f1 is an idea, trying to trap the queen. So queen h3 is not a good move. You cannot play that. If you play queen d6, which was played in the game, now white has also another brilliant follow-up. Rook comes into g6, attacking the queen. Cannot take the uh, rook, obviously, because of the pin. The pawn on f7 is not allowed to move. Queen to d8. And the rook is just standing there happily. Cannot be kicked out. Queen to g1. Another piece joining the attack. Is there an immediate threat? Well, if black would take this pawn on f4, you can take on h6. The g pawn is pinned. And materials even. But look at white's pieces. So many attackers are here. This looks incredibly dangerous. Therefore, black didn't capture the pawn here. Instead, play the move queen h4. Try to consolidate the, uh, the king side bring another piece into defense and attack at the same time. And I think this is a critical moment. Both players were getting lower on time. And uh, Yilmaz played here to move rook d2, g2. Very understandable. But 
Let's have a look because this pawn on h6 could still have been taken. And the big question is why did um, uh, Yilmaz not play this move? Well, if you go queen takes f4, everything is hanging. Look at, look at the rooks, look at the knight, everything is hanging. But there is rook takes h5. And if you do take the rook on d2, now the beautiful killer move is knight g6, setting up the huge threat of playing rook h8 with checkmate. And once again, f-pawn is pinned. You cannot do anything. And look at black's pieces on the queen start. Far away, absolutely helpless. They cannot parry all these threats. This could be one reason. Another reason I think uh, Fabiano um, thought this was maybe still playable for him is that there is something like knight g3. Discover check. And uh, after queen takes g3, queen takes h6. Um, materially speaking, this is good for black, but white has a huge initi initiative with a move like uh, knight to g4. The rook will come over, the pawns can start rolling. For instance, if you play queen g6, now I'm going to play f5. If the queen goes to g5, something like bishop c1, bringing another piece into the attack is a huge idea. Black's pieces are not doing much. Rook d1 to protect the bishop, intending to swing the rook over to the g-file, will give white a devastating attack. But Yilmaz wanted to play it safe. He was not interested in taking that pawn on h6. Played here the move rook d2, g2. But now it's queen takes f4. You don't have to capture with a knight. You can take with a queen and attack the knight on e5 at the same time. So bishop c1 bringing the bishop with a gain of time in the attack runs into queen takes e5. That's not what you should do. That means there are huge problems. Knight is hanging. What are you going to do? If you ever take on f7, rook on c7 is still defending and black will get two minor pieces for the for the rook and uh, his pieces are doing, doing fine. Pawn on g7 is very well defended by both the bishop and the knight. So what is white going to do? White is in trouble, it looks like. Rook e6. This is an incredible move. What, what is the point of it? Look, you are protecting the knight on e5. And the key idea is that if black ignores this insane looking move, there is bishop c1 attacking the queen. If the queen goes to h4, then instead of going to f4, you can take the pawn on h6 and white breaks through with a huge mating attack. But the critical question, of course, is what happens if you take the rook? Bishop takes e6. And where do you go now after bishop takes e6? Well, if you play here king h8, there is the move knight g6 with a knight fork. White is winning the queen. You can't do that. So after bishop takes e6, only move is king h7, bishop f5. And here Fabiano blitzed out here to move king g8. He was absolutely relieved. And both players repeated the moves here, settling for a draw. Very understandable, but let's go back one second. Is there not a way to keep the game alive? Well, if Fabiano maybe would not have been under such huge pressure and he had more time on the clock, he would probably consider alternatives. Well, there are not that many moves, it's a check. But there's this insane looking move. Queen takes f5. What is this? You're giving up your queen, but don't forget white has already sacrificed the rook. After e takes f5, let's have a look at the material. It's a rook and the bishop for the queen. And with the move rook e7 now, you're attacking the knight and the knight is not stable at all. It cannot count on the support of the f-pawn because that opens up the diagonal for the bishop. Once again, pawn on g7 is very well defended. If you would consider something like knight g6 to attack the rook, the rook will come into e3 and on the next move, you will take with the bishop on f3. Now white has not succeeded in keeping the diagonal close. The bishop comes alive, pinning the rook. That is uh, already crushing, but also ideas like rook e8, intending to go rook e1, highlights the misplacement of the queen on g1 if the center is getting opened for the black rooks. Here, black has a decisive advantage. It's maybe not obvious yet, but the longer you look at the position, the more it becomes clear how problematic white's uh, position is. Lack of coordination, materially speaking, black is also okay, but also bishop on b2, for instance, is not doing that much. So I think this mini match is probably the most dramatic one of maybe the entire tournament so far, for sure, for the third round, in, in my opinion. Incredible that in this first game, Fabiano missed this 
relatively simple win. In this game, both sides had their chances. Two draws is the result, which means the players are going for a tiebreak tomorrow. And well, let's gonna see what, uh, what will happen there. Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe and soon much more coverage of this fantastic tournament. See you soon.